I'm Tenery Taylor, and this is Constant Wonder. In the last several decades, noodle soup in the U.S. has become much more varied than your grandmother's chicken noodle. We have ramen, udon, and the popular pho with its thinly sliced beef, rice noodles, and savory broth. We're going to give you some tips on making good pho at home. First, though, we're going to explore the origins of this popular dish with cooking instructor and cookbook writer. Andrea Nguyen. She's the author of The Pho Cookbook, Easy to Adventurous Recipes for Vietnam's Favorite Soup and Noodles. And her most recent book is Vietnamese Food Any Day, Simple Recipes for True, Fresh Flavors. Welcome to Constant Wonder. Thanks for having me today, Tenery. Now, for anyone who has maybe not been converted to pho yet, tell us a little bit about what's the draw. I mean, why so popular? I loved how you said that, you know, noodle soup, we all love noodle soup. And there is a different kind of noodle soup for every single cuisine. Because we love noodles, we love broth, it's comforting food, especially, you know, in the cooler times of the year. And it's slurpy. And the wonderful thing about pho is that you can totally have it your way which means, you know, you can style it how you want with the condiments and the different garnishes. You you can have different proteins. There's even like vegetarian pho. So there is pho for any person out there, anytime, any day. (laughs) Now, I understand that pho is sometimes seen as a something like a guilty pleasure in Vietnamese culture. Is that true? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, you know, it's it's like this, uh, you, you sneak away for a bowl, you know, and you can have it uh, pho with your friends and your family or, or there's also, you know, this, this thing that goes back to um, pho, the noodle soup or gum with his rice. And it's this thing where you'll, if you're in Vietnam, you see these signs that say pho and gum. And um, I asked my parents about it, and my mom's like, well, gum, which means rice, is like, well, your wife. And my dad goes, pho, and he kind of wiggled his hips, and he's like, well, that's like your girlfriend. And I was (laughs) like, I thought, my God, they're in their 80s. (laughs) And so I think that that's what it's it's speaking to, that notion, but it's just a very playful thing. It's a type of signage that you would see, old-fashioned signage in Vietnam. but, you know, it speaks to the ubiquity of pho. It's as ubiquitous, you know, as common, as quotidian as rice. Um, because it is like this, this thing, this dish that in, in many ways is the dish of Vietnam. Do you remember the first time you ever had it? Yes, um, I remember it. I also, you know, am reminded of it by my parents. Um, I was around five or five and a half. We still lived in Saigon. And this was maybe, you know, like around 1974. And um, they took me to their favorite little pho shop. And I sat on this bench and, um, you know, in a very humble place and worked my way from the top of the bowl to the bottom and emptied it with my own, you know, chopsticks and, and spoon, and they were so proud that their five-year-old was able to empty out a bowl of pho that they were just pleased as punch. And I guess that's why I grew up nice and chubby. (laughs) So um, when did you move to America and did you have to make your own pho when you got here or were you able to find noodle shops that served it? My family luckily uh, left Vietnam in 1975, one week before the fall of Saigon. And, um, and when we came here, we were among the first wave of Vietnamese refugees to land in the United States. There were no pho shops, you know? And so um, refugee families like mine did what other immigrants to America did. We, we made do. And um, my mother was a darn good cook in Vietnam. And um, she, you know, once that she got her hands on decent rice noodles and um, rice, you know, and, and other kinds of, of rice ingredient, rice based ingredients like like rice paper. But, you know, once she got, she got the rice noodles and the fish sauce um, in Chinatown, 
in Los Angeles because we settled in Southern California. Um, once she got her hands on those ingredients, she was able to start building um, bowls of pho in um, her own kitchen in California. And her experiments, you know, changed over time. And so like a lot of other Vietnamese refugee families, we, you know, we cobbled things together. And, and I'll tell you, you know, there were certain changes that were made. For example, in Vietnam, um, pho broth is made with um, shallots, very tiny shallots, the size of boiling onions that people would um, grill um, on a charcoal brazier along with the ginger. Well, shallots in America are expensive, right? So then a lot of Vietnamese American cooks like my mother switched to using yellow onion, which is not as pungent, it's sweeter than shallots. So mm -hmm. the flavor profile of pho changed. Um, and so a lot of immigrants came from Southern Vietnam, from Saigon, and the flavor profile of Saigon food or Saigon pho tends to be more sweet than savory. Whereas northern style pho, mm -hmm. northern style pho is um, more salty, more savory than sweet. So what we experience in the United States is oftentimes southern style pho, southern Vietnamese style pho, which is a little sweeter in the broth. So that's why it takes, you know, it takes to the lime juice really well and the chilies and stuff. So, you know, there were like changes that were made. The other change was like the bowls got a lot bigger. Because <laughs> um, everything kind of, you know, gets bigger once you're super sized States. in America. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Like big bodacious bowls. Now, you mentioned that pho can be personalized. It can even be vegetarian, which I think is kind of antithetical to what pho is supposed to be. But um, how did your family like to eat it? Well, um, my mother was originally born in northern Vietnam. And she is one of these, you know, kind of, um, she's pretty traditional, um, except she, um, along with her, many of her family members migrated to um, South Vietnam in 1954 under the Geneva Accords when the country was split into two. Mm -hmm. So at that time, um, a lot of Northerners, like my mother's family, decided that they wanted to be in more uh, the nationalistic um, side of the country. So they moved southward, whereas the northern part of the country um, eventually became communist. And so they brought their northern pho traditions with them, smaller bowls, um, a broth that was saltier than sweet. And they introduced that style of pho to the south. Um, in southern Vietnam, where people love to live large, um, the bowls got bigger and the meats got a lot more um, complex, you know, with all like the, the tripe and the tendon and then all the different kinds of herbs and the sauces and stuff. So when I grew up with pho, it was like a mostly Northern Vietnamese bowl, meaning that um, no limes, um, no, um, sriracha sauce, no Thai basil. I, and you're like, no, what? There's nothing left. <laughs> um, <Right>. No <laughs> bean sprouts. Because what was really important to my mother and is still true today about Northern Viet Vietnamese style pho, which is basically Hanoi style pho, is that the broth stands out. Do not futz with the broth by adding too much stuff to it mm. to ruin it. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we, we didn't have any of those things. She was like, mint, that's all you get. Mint, cilantro in the bowl, mint on the side, if you're lucky. <laughs> and, <laughs> I mean, today, but I, that said, now, you know, she's like in her mid eighties now. Now it's like, I present her with some Thai basil. She goes, oh, that tastes really nice. So people do change. <laughs> I want to I want to go even back further um, before your mother's time and and describe kind of where pho came from, um, and I think we have to maybe understand the various wo world cultures and world powers that were at play during the early 1900s in Vietnam. Sure, you know a lot. There's been a lot said about how pho came um, uh, from French pot au feu. Because, you know, there's the pho, the fire in pot au feu, which is a French um, 
a brothy dish of long simmer beef and um, vegetables. And, and sometimes there are some spices in there. But, and the word pho sounds like pho. But the fact that the words sound the same doesn't necessarily mean that they're connected. Um, the French were in Vietnam, you know, for a total official total of 75 years. And at the beginning of the 20th century, um, so, you know, 120 plus years ago, the French were there as colonial powers and the colonials enjoyed their beef. Now, cows in Vietnam were draft animals. They were work animals. People didn't really eat them. If they ate any um, animals were, that were that large, they were water buffaloes. Um, but, but the French wanted, you know, their steaks and, and tender cuts. So they would um, start harvesting the cows. And they left the, the, the story goes that they left the tough cuts for the Vietnamese. Mm. And so um, butchers in and around Hanoi in northern Vietnam had all of these parts left over, tough cups of meat, um, bones, and they needed to sell them all. So they started selling them. And um, the street vendors who were at that time already selling a water buffalo based noodle soup made with round shaped rice noodles, they were like, hey, you know, here's a bargain. Let's do something with it. So they started um, creating a, a brothy soup made with beef and um, cooked the uh, chewy cuts for a long time and then thinly sliced them and served them with these round rice noodles. And eventually those noodles changed to the flat uh, rice noodles that we see today. And, and a lot of those um, cooks were Chinese Vietnamese um, living and, and selling. They were the street vendors at the time. And all of this happened on Vietnamese soil. So when people say to me, oh, pho has to be descended from, you know, French pot au pho, I'm like, no, pho came about by a matter of cultures rubbing shoulders in a particular mm. place. And that particular place happened to be Vietnam. So you've got the French, you've got, you know, the Chinese, you've got the Vietnamese, and then you've got all of these people who are eating the noodle soup, day laborers, and then eventually, you know, people who were in business because this noodle soup became very popular. So it becomes like this universal noodle soup. And so it's not of a French origin. It's, it's the origin is murky. It is in a very interesting way, a fusion food, mm -hmm. but it is holy, holy. Vietnamese. And I understand that throughout the 20th century, um, pho could be sometimes a, kind of a lightning rod for conflict within Vietnam. Could you tell us about some of the political movements that may be um, co-opted? I don't know, that may be too strong of a word, um, pho to their purposes. Sure. You know, pho has been used um, in poetry, um, I translated a poem um, from Vietnamese that, where the, the poet said, compared pho to like some of the best foods in, in the world. And he said, even the Frenchmen who taste pho need to admit that it is, you know, one of the best foods on the planet. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where, you know, you, you get Vietnamese people flexing and just <laughs> saying, you know, we're, we're, we're just as good as anybody else. And that's always, you know, kind of the Vietnamese spirit of self-determination and sort of a pugilistic little country, but we're tough when we're mighty, we're creative, you know, we got our pho and everybody loves it and everybody knows it's really good. Um, during the um, Vietnam War in um, Saigon, there was a little pho shop where um, the uh, Northern Vietnamese like stage, you know, they secretly made plans for um, different maneuvers um, to infiltrate the South. You know, we, we also have like, um, I interviewed a, a cousin of mine who lived in uh, Northern Vietnam and still does during the Vietnam War. And there were times when the, um, the foe was just terrible um, because the nation was under rationing. Um, and so the pho tasted yucky or it was watered down. It's been in people's memoirs because um, uh, there is um, 
a memoir that I cite in um, the folk cookbook that talks about during the war, how, how people would like have to eat like this terrible, terrible pho. And if you could find like an illegal pho vendor on the street who would kind of like show you that they had like, really good noodles and really good broth, you would have to eat the bowl really, really quickly mm-hmm. because to have like a really good bowl of pho meant mm-hmm. that, you know, you were like a, a bougie sellout kind of thing. So it was like a political lightning rod, like you talked about Tenery. Mm-hmm. And, and so pho plays out in many different ways in Vietnamese culture and cuisine. But at the end of the day, you know, Vietnamese people were, were very individualistic. We'll fight about, you know, North and, Northern and Southern pho. We'll fight about what's the iconic Vietnamese dish amongst ourselves. We get us all in a room and you say, well, what's the number <laughs> one dish of Vietnam? And we'll say, oh, it's pho. But what does that mean? <laughs> that means, I know, that means it will like to you, you know, We'll like unify behind it, behind it, but like amongst ourselves, we'll like say, "Oh well, the South has a better bowl, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the North has a better bowl, and I know how to eat it, you know, properly." And my mother makes the best version. So, what's your favorite bowl of pho? Uh, what What do you like to put into it? I um, I like a simple bowl, to tell you the truth, just with like really good broth that hasn't been watered down. A lot of times, what happens is. Um, people will make a very concentrated broth and then they dilute it. And sometimes in that dilution, it um, gets a little bit too watery. So um, I just, how do you make your broth? I want to know where do you, well, I, I simmer it for a long time or I use a pressure cooker. I use um, really good um, flavorful bones. Um, Most of the time sourced from grass fed um, cows. And um, I love fatty brisket. Um, cause it has a great chew and a nice amount of fat on it. Um, I, I will scrape the tendon from the bones cause you know, bones are like expensive now when you go to make pho, you are competing with brothers. Mm-hmm. I just want to, the audience to know that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so the prices of beef bones has gone up. I combine my bones. So I'll use leg bones. I'll use knuckle bones and I'll use neck bones too for good flavor. Um, and I simmer it with, um, spices, star anise, um, cinnamon, fennel. Um, and sometimes if I'm going Northern South, uh, I will use a particular spice that's called a black cardamom. It's the size of an olive and it's kind of smoky and mentally, but it has just the right flavor note. Um, do you have, do you have to grind that down like a nutmeg or do you put it in whole? No, you want to put it in whole Mm, because, um, your whole spices will not cloud up the broth. If you use ground up spices, Mm -hmm. it it will create a cloudy broth. And so you want to do a gentle simmer, um, you know, for like two, two and a half hours or so, or you can do it in a pressure cooker, um, for something that's a little quicker. And, um, and I just, you know, I, if I want to, I'll have like the rare beef in there. But otherwise, you know, I am very happy with beautiful fatty slices of brisket and tendon and, you know, various herbs and stuff. And it just, even like when I'm making the pho, the house smells good, you know, I mean, <laughs> grits, I, I'll like cook the, um, the shallot or onion and ginger on the stove top. I have a gas stove. And the house just smells so wonderful. It smells like my mother's home. It smells like I'm in Vietnam. And it just takes me back to a particular place. And that's what cooking is. Um, it's more than, you know, co- we cook to eat. But but I think the process of making food is very um, meditative. And for everybody who enjoys a bowl of pho, I encourage them to make it too, because you'll appreciate a really good bowl, whether you make it yourself or when someone else makes it for you. Now, if somebody wants to tackle making that broth like you do, what's the best source for getting those bones? You just, you know, um, farmer's markets, a good butcher shop, a regular supermarket. Um, I recently, actually just today, I was at a Rouse market which is in um, the family of like um, Kroger markets, which mm-hmm. is the America's largest chain of supermarkets. They had the most gorgeous marrow bones. And nowadays with the way American groceries are, you can source a lot of ingredients, if not everything um, at 
the American grocery store to make yourself a darn good bowl of pho, including the noodles. One of the things is that I, in my, in my work, I always tell people, you can make this food, you can go shop at an Asian market. And, and some people do if that's accessible to them. You can also order some of these ingredients. Some of these spices that I talk about um, are certainly obtainable um, online. Um, you can also buy these, you know, star anise at a regular grocery store. Mm -hmm. um, and so, it, and there are, you know, certain substitutes that, that I have in the book for example, there is a particular kind of sugar, a yellow rock sugar that's used oftentimes in making a, um, a southern style Vietnamese pho broth, kind of sweet, savory. Well, my solution is to use um, a Fuji apple. Um, mm. or, and then if you want to tweak the flavors a little bit, to use a little maple syrup or organic um, cane sugar. And it imparts just the right kind of sweet, round note to, to just soften the edges of the faux broth and to bring the broth alive. And you, know, you don't need to necessarily, you don't need to go to an Asian market unless you want to, because there are certain workarounds. And, and people will say, well, that doesn't sound very authentic, you know, because I, I, I think I need all those Asian ingredients. Well, the thing with the sugar, I'll tell you, because this is a southern, um, northern Vietnamese pho fight kind of situation. <laughs> so the, the southerners like to, to add a little sweetener, a little sugar. And the northerners, um, they'll use sometimes like dry seafood or something like that. And I remember asking a cousin of mine who's around my age, like what she did and whether or not she used MSG or, um, or any kind of um, sugar. She goes, oh, no. Never, never. I never put that sugar into my broth. I put sugar cane into my first stock pot. And I'm like, girlfriend, <laughs> that is sugar. <laughs> so, so, um, so then I thought, well, what, what can I, you know, what can I use at my disposal as if I'm just like the regular American cook, but I want these flavors. And a Fuji apple really, really does it well. And there's the other thing um, that is oftentimes used for pho, which is MSG. And there has been a lot of information out there about how terrible MSG is. And I think that it does affect people um, differently, especially when too much of it is in food. And MSG has a flavor, mm -hmm. but MSG can also, when used judiciously, just send a bowl of pho right over the top. So um, people have grown more open-minded about using MSG in food. So, you know, sometimes if you just feel like you need that little extra something, don't be afraid to use MSG. It's sold at regular American supermarkets as Accent, um, which is available in small um, round containers um, in the spice section. I just saw it today at the supermarket. <laughs> Andrea Nguyen is the author of The Pho Cookbook, Easy to Adventurous Recipes for Vietnam's Favorite Soup and Noodles. She's also got a new book out, Vietnamese Food Any Day, Simple Recipes for True, Fresh Flavors. Thank you so much for sharing your insight today on Constant Wonder. My pleasure, Tenery. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is Constant Wonder. I'm Tenery Taylor. And I'm Marcus Smith. Now, whether it's Vietnamese pho or, well, any other kind of noodle from just about anywhere... Italy has a lot of noodles, I hear, you know, linguine, fettuccine, spaghetti. If it's got the right sauce on it or gravy or broth, uh, it's just, uh, well, it's, it's, it's the best kind of comfort food. And this probably explains the YouTube phenomenon of the pasta grannies. The pasta grannies have over 700,000 subscribers, every last one of them wishing they had their own grandmother to make pasta for them. More about the pasta grannies when Constant Wonder returns in just a moment. Welcome back to Constant Wonder. I'm Marcus Smith. One of the hottest YouTube channels of recent years, Pasta Grannies, with over 700 subscribers. I had a chance to speak with its creator, Vicki Benison. 
And、uh, we thought this would be a good way, well, a, a good globe balancing counterpart to the conversation we've just heard about Vietnamese pho.、Uh, but this is going to start in a rather unusual place. Vicky Benison, it turns out, has had a kind of crazy culinary career, including not just Italian pasta, but also hunting wild mushrooms and even experiments with zebra stew. My career is colourful, as you said, and I used to work in something called international development.、Um, is that the same phrase over in America? Yes, yes. And、uh, so I got sent around the world, and I worked in places like Siberia and South Africa and Turkmenistan, and always managed to have lots of adventures around food. So mushroom hunting. I think one of the things about being a woman in strange places is that they tend to, on your own without your family, so they tend to treat you as an honorary male. So I got invited along、um, by the local business sort of Rotary Club because I'd expressed an interest in mushrooms, and so they took me into the Tiger Forest, and I spent a day scrabbling around in absolute freezing cold looking for mushrooms. And、um, when I got home, I was so. Cold. I had to go to bed immediately. I don't think I ever ate the mushrooms either. But、um, <laughs> I was, it's、um, yes, and and、um, so in in Siberia as well. You know, you'd find things like、um, there were a lot of、um, Koreans. There was a Korean community, and they did things with fresh horseradish and tomatoes as a kind of salsa, which I'd never come across before. And and. The summer is so short that you have to bottle everything. So you grow your tomatoes and then you sort of bottle them and then you put them in a great heap under a blanket and you and you you cook them in the sun. <laughs> so those those are the sorts of things that intrigued me as I was、uh, doing my work. Zebra stew. Oh yes, <clears throat> well、um, the zebra stew was actually when I was doing、um, a trek. Um, a sort of fundraising trek、um, in association with the British Army up to Lake Turkana in northern Kenya.、Uh, so zebra was kind of easier to come by than than beef, and it was a sort of special occasion stew.、Um, so of course, if you're not keen on eating horses, then you're very unlikely to even want to even try a zebra. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, that was supper. So for me, eating something like that is not something I'd ever choose. But because it's a special occasion and it's someone has gone to the trouble of making it, you always eat it.、Yeah. You just eat eat what you're given and be grateful. <laughs> when I was a young、Smile、boy, <laughs> so, somebody gave me rattlesnake meat to eat once when I was a young kid. Oh, you! What was that like? Well, the traditional way you respond to that question is you say, "Tastes like chicken." And that's the pretty standard、uh, response. Do, what did the, the zebra meat taste like? Was it、uh, like game?、Um, don't don't rush out and get it. <laughs> <Don't> <laughs> <laughs> They're much nicer to look at the animal live, really. <laughs> well, let's go to Italy then.、Uh, the、yeah. series began because it was just something that came to you in a dream in the middle of the night. I don't know. How did you start it? Yeah. Well, I have. It's a bit of a long story, but I, I actually moved from London to Italy, and then pretty much immediately met my husband, who happened to be my childhood sweetheart, twenty years previously.、Um, and so I never actually got to live in Italy, but I did have a house in Italy,、um, and so. I've been lucky. We have been lucky enough to sort of keep that house going and go out uh, regularly, um, treat it as a home rather than a holiday home that you see once a year or something. So,、um, and in my regular trips out there,、um, I noticed that the skills, these domestic skills of pasta making, sort of stopped at around sixty-five, and the, the younger women. All were going out to work. You know, they were sort of slaves to the school curriculum, and you know, were busy、uh, all the time with their kids and and all that kind of thing. It's it's a similar story everywhere in the world, I think. And and that these skills were just not being passed on anymore. That they would go out and buy their pasta,、um, and their children's tastes were changing. That they didn't necessarily want to eat fresh pasta. They were kind of moving in the direction that you do. You know, sort of open the packet of pasta is a much easier thing to do. And so I thought, oh well, that's you know, that's a shame. Sort of everybody takes for granted that their grandmother is the best cook, but what Granny is going to be cooking in twenty years' time isn't actually 
the same as what it is at the moment. And so let's make a record of that. And so I started just writing about it and that wasn't enough. And neither was photography because pasta making is a very physical thing. You don't really get the sort of the welly, the, the, the sort of effort that you put into rolling out or kneading your dough. So that's when I picked up a camera and started filming. My husband's a television producer, so I got a little bit of guidance um, on it. So to start with, of course, YouTube is where you put this stuff. <laughs> and so I'd occasionally upload it. And then you kind of become, well, I became vaguely aware that, oh, that, you know, there's an algorithm. And, and, you know, if you want an audience, then you have to be a slave to that algorithm. <laughs> You know, you have to upload weekly. And so I started taking it more seriously. And that's how the channel got going. And um, why why did you settle on doing these grandmothers, these grannies? There is such an mm-hmm. appetite for learning how to do food properly and correctly. And you, yes. why not a professional chef? Well, professional chefs always sort of attribute their inspiration to grandmothers and their mothers. and But we never see them. And that was a sort of another um, motivation for me was that um, these women are often off stage um, and I wanted uh, to actually sort of put them center stage and celebrate them. Um, We shouldn't be too romantic about uh, the passing of of their life styles, which is actually quite hard work, but we should salute them, I think. So that was another reason for um, putting women there. these women don't put themselves forward either. They're quite shy and retiring and take for granted that they have these skills. They've never actually sort of reflected on that either. Well, if they're shy and retiring, as you say, yeah. <laughs> uh, putting them on camera might be a bit of a challenge. Yes, it is. <laughs> how, yes, how, it do you, is. how do you persuade them to participate with you? Uh, I would imagine there are some that maybe some people have actually turned you down and said, no, nope, I'm not going to do that. Oh, frequently, Fre- even at the front door. I mean... <laughs> You know, they sort of said, no, I don't want to be filmed. And it's like, oh, <laughs> but you've said yes until now. Um, so I have a granny finder. She's called Livia Di Giovanni. And um, I find that even though I speak Italian, it's essential to have an Italian um, to close the deal, if you like. Um, and she does a marvelous job of um, persuading people who would normally say no into saying yes. And then the next trick is to make sure that when we do film them, um, that it's like a conversation. We don't come in with, you know, huge cameras and we film in real time. We don't make them rehearse or anything like that. So we, we kind of keep it low key and conversational. And um, they're always very happy to do it. They may they realize that actually it's not like performing on stage or anything like that. So it becomes an easy experience for them. You called Livia a granny finder. I think the term yeah. might be gran- a granny whisperer is what she really is. Yes, yes. <laughs> it, very much so. I mean, she's remarkable. When you listen to her, um, she kind of comes around sort of several times. You know, someone may have said no, but then the third time that sort of Livia has come around and sort of talked to her sort of, you know, conversationally, you know, she'll sort of come around, she'll go away, she'll come around. <laughs> Cool. And they're so bedazzled by the end of it, they say, yeah, OK. <laughs> Vicky, I, I think you've been to the United States to tape as well. Yes, yes, yes. I was so excited. Um, only a toe in the water. I went to New York and, and filmed uh, four, four women there. Um, and because I was very intrigued to know how uh, recipes change once you've moved to a different country or culture. Um, and also how food helps to maintain traditions when you haven't made that move. So, yes, I sort of found one or two people, and then um, they actually volunteered. In fact, they re- I've got people nowadays kind of write and say, oh, I'd love you know you to, to meet my grandmother and film my grandmother. And I say, well, where in the world are you? And they say, you know, San Francisco or somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and I get, well... Okay, I'm going to have to find about 10 other grannies to sort of make that trip worthwhile um, (laughs) because cost does come into it. Um, So, yes, um, my plans are to sort of visit America again. um, And also I seem to be very popular down in Brazil. (laughs) 
there seem to be lots of Italians down there um, and Australia, places like that that you can visit and actually sort of film some of these women. I, I'd love to be able to travel the world doing that. Mm. Well, one of my favorite so, segments that I yeah. was able to see involved a very, very short woman, one of the oldest participants. I can't remember if she was 95, 96, 97. She was nearing 100. And uh, she had to get up on a little stool in, yes. in order to really... Yes, just Giuseppe. And, I'm, and this leads to that question I wanted to ask you about. How much is this series really even about food? Is, is, is food front and center stage? No, I think it's about uh, just as much about the grandmothers as it is about the food. You know, with five-minute um, maximum videos, you can't sort of learn too much about them. But you, if we can sort of learn a little bit about them and about their lives – um, their environment, you know, if I can get a sort of shot of their kitchen or something like that, I'll try and put it in or their animals or if their daughter or granddaughter is around, you know, see if they can join in with the pasta making. I try and sort of add a bit of colour that way. Um, yes, it's equally important, I would say. Any sense at all from these women that they mm. have any kind of chagrin or worries about what they know and what they have mastered is not being passed on to younger generations? Yes, they kind of, oh, you know, they're sort of exasperated. Um, and that's, I think, partly why they say yes, so that there is a record of what they do. There are some areas of Italy, like in Romagna, sort of, you know, Bologna and East, where there are still quite a lot of pasta making. So it's not sort of uniform or um, uniform across Italy. Um, but certainly they are very much aware, you know, that they're still cooking for their family because their daughter doesn't do it at all. Is there that, that, that social thing of... Um, Women in their 40s and 50s now, when they were young, they were told sort of that actually to be a modern woman, you gave up the kitchen, you went into um, work, out to work, um, and that, you know, all this cookery um, should be left behind. And I think then the next generation have gone, oh, hang on a minute. <laughs> No, that's not right. Um, so actually, I find there are quite a lot of younger people who are my eight, the biggest age group that watches Pasta Granny is, is 25 to 35. It's it's not the older ones. Um, that's I mean, very that's interesting. That, Fascinating to me. Mm, mm, and I think encouraging. I, I, you know, I think food continues to be always more than just simply nutrition and putting food on the table. I mean, for grandmothers, it's about putting love on the table as well. It doesn't matter what your age is, that you respond to that. Um, I like the fact that my program is kind of wholesome yeah. well, <laughs> because that's what food is. I think that's, that's, that's important to me anyway. When I sat down with my children and we watched a few episodes of Pasta mm -hmm. Grannies, uh, I'm going to go back to this old woman, nearly 100, Giuseppe. Mm. Uh, she, mm. she made a different, uh, two different types of, of noodle pa yeah. pasta, but they were shaped differently. And this just leads, is all pasta really the same, but in different shapes and sizes? Can you tell much of the difference? <laughs> yes. Uh, there are two main um, types. Um, there's with egg pasta which is made with a soft wheat uh, flour and then there's the um, uh, durum wheat um, flour which you call semolina in america semolina flour and that uses only water um, and that comes from the south of italy and also Sard sardinia um, so giuseppe is from sardinia and she would have been um, she does use the semolina and water pasta type as an aside, you do find there are other flowers that sometimes get used, like buckwheat up in the Alps and that kind of thing. But those, those are the two main types of pasta. And you're right, there is a limit to what you can do with dough by hand. Um, but <laughs> the names <laughs> are extraordinary. You can have one pasta with about six different names and you can have one name that applies to several different pastas. And it's just very complicated. <laughs> um, and so, um, 
so the pastors that you get in Sardinia, I mean, you referred to Laurie Gitas um, in your introduction, and this is a wonderful kind of um, pasta that looks like an earring, um, a sort of hoop earring that is made for All Saints Day. It's a religious pasta, and it's made in one town only called Morgan Jory. Um, and Giuseppe um, doesn't make that because she's down the road. She's up towards uh, uh, Alghero in the northeast of Sardinia. And so she makes these little gnocchi type pastas. Um, and the one that she showed in the, the film was a, a one called uh, Macaronis de Ungia. And that means fingernail pasta because they're so tiny. <laughs> That's really sweet. <laughs> Well, I wonder, and this is just a conjecture on my part, but the mm. idea that you have a variety of shapes because yeah. maybe otherwise the uniformity would be so stifling that if you come out of economic hardship and maybe this is uh, what you have to eat as something of a staple, at least you get variety in, in shapes and sizes. Yeah, I mean, in fact, it changes from village to village. Um, and so, yes, you have variety, but I think... The pasta making is is mostly a family and a friend's kind of group activity. And so you have to have consensus around the table as you make it. Because, you know, women used to get together and have a good old gossip. This is a great sort of chance to socialize. Um, and so within that group, you need to agree on the size and the name. <laughs> and never mind what anybody else does, which <laughs> I think is... <laughs> So it can kind of vary from street to street. And so uh, from the outside, yes, you have variety. But actually, when you're in that village, um, you have about two or three different pastas uh, that people can agree on and that, that will be made regularly. Um, so does that make sense? It does indeed. <laughs> uh, Vicki Benison, finally, I want to wrap this up by stepping a little bit uh, away from just this specific series called Pasta Grannies and ask mm -hmm. you a little bit about the general place of this kind of programming in our modern world? What do you think you're doing for people on the whole with, with food that is presented in a way that is entertainment? Maybe it's food as theater. I'm not sure. Food is theater. Food is love. Uh, food uh, that nourishes just not your, your tummy, but your heart as well. Um, I, I couldn't have got this past a commissioning editor on, on tr terrestrial or cable TV or anything, but I think um, it, it so happens that I stumbled across something that I could put on YouTube that has, has found a niche. I think it strikes a chord with people that it's, I think, it sounds, I hope it doesn't sound too corny, but, you know, you're kind of sharing the love that these women love their families, love being able to put food on the table and that's an expression of their love and I think everybody responds to that I think um, uh, yes I mean the comments that I get um, from people is is about 30 percent of the food is great always the food but they especially love the grandmothers um, and have you ever thought that this might be because people are responding to programming that is not about elites and is sort of anti-sophistication. Uh, I think that's true, yes. I think um, food is still fairly democratic in, in um, Italy as well. And um, it's not... It, it doesn't sort of put up barriers in the way that chef, chefing, you know, it's so pre precise. Of course, chefs are marvellous um, and it's great watching them and stuff, but you're not encouraged necessarily unless you're already a committed, um, you know, gourmet into rushing into the kitchen. Whereas I think with the grandmothers, it's like, yeah, you know, share it. You can do this too. <laughs> it's not difficult. <laughs> Vicki Benison is creator of Pasta Grannies, the YouTube channel, and author of Pasta Grannies, the official cookbook, The Secrets of Italy's Best Home Cooks. When you survey the great food traditions around the world, you just see noodles all over the place. Lots of people making noodles for, well, who knows how long. And who invented them, we really don't know. Then there's that other magical thing people have been doing with dough, making bread, and the old world traditions involve natural leavening. We're going to go visit a sourdough library when Constant Wonder returns after this. Stay tuned. I'm Marcus Smith. This is Constant Wonder. 
If you want to learn how to make homemade pasta, go to the Pasta Granny's YouTube channel. Good source of information. If, however, you want to learn about ancient sourdough, you might want to visit the Purato Sourdough Library in Belgium. It's the only sourdough library in the world. A rare thing. And I spoke with Carl Desmet, the curator of that library. Here's a highlight of our conversation. Uh, this is a very strange or unique opportunity. Are you the only sourdough librarian this world has? Uh, as far as I know, uh, yes. Our in, our initiative of having that that only world sourdough library is uh, is something very unique yeah, that we haven't seen anywhere else. But you're collecting these and you're working for an organization that is trying to assemble this this library. Is library the right word, actually? Yes, it, we really look at it as a library because a library is a place where you can study. And that is what we want to do with, with this initiative, which is a, a non-profit or a non-for-profit initiative of us. Uh, being a commercial company, but we, we do believe that we have to do this to contribute to the world of fermentation. Having a place where you have, well, for the moment, we have 124 samples. And I'm, I'm right now, right now I'm in Slovenia to pick up sample number 125. Uh, having them in one place where you can compare them, taste them, smell them, look at their fermentation power, that is something that that makes that library so unique that that we have this vast scale now of, of sourdoughs from 22 countries, uh, which is not enough today. Eh? We, we still want it to grow, but it is giving us incredible insights. Well, if you have about 124 samples, this is not like a book library. You put a book on a shelf, it just stays there. Th this is a living library. It's These things are alive. How do you, how do you keep them alive? Well, we, we, uh, the initiative for that, we work together with Professor Marco Gobetti from the University in Bari in Italy and in Bolzano. And these kind of, uh, well, very well, uh, well, deep into sourdough as well. And in his lab, he set up a protocol in order to keep the microorganisms alive. Uh, and therefore, we have to feed every sample every two months three times in a row and then put them back in the in the fridge in their jars uh, sealed and to do that we have also from each starter we have the original flower or in some cases there is one sourdough that has six flowers inside so we have also a, a, a huge collection of, uh, of different flowers so if you drive back to Belgium with this sample from Slovenia is it just uh -huh. in a simple glass jar with a sealed lid uh, I'll take three samples, actually. I have two, two plastic uh, buckets in which I collect 500 grams each or a pound you know, in the U.S. And then I have one glass jar. And I have a special cool box that guarantees 96 hours of, uh, of cool temperature. So I, it will take me like 10 hours to go back. So it will be more than enough to, to keep it in good conditions. Have you ever lost a sample because the the refrigeration failed on you? I mean, did you ever get back to Belgium and say, "Oh no, that was that was a loss"? Yes, it happened. It happened with sourdough number one hundred and four. There was a misunderstanding. It was from a guy, Will Lawrence Grant, on Bainbridge Island, who makes the best pizza of the U.S. And I picked up his sourdough. Well, I I went to his place and explained to him how to wrap. Uh, the sourdough and so on, but he didn't send it by DHL. He just sent it by U.S. Postal Services or something like that, and it got stuck at Belgian Customs for two months, uh, for two weeks, and then it arrived in our office and everything was molded and so on. But we just we just sent a new box and then we made a, a proper proper transportation <laughs> back to square so one. <laughs> always, always uh, it always comes together. <laughs> well, uh, tell me, if you would, about the selection process, because I have seen from a website from Puratos, I believe, or maybe it was from a video presentation you gave, a, a, a map of the a, a globe, and there were little dots yes. all over the globe yeah. showing all of these locations yeah. for different samples, and yet you don't go after every one. You, you go after specific samples. Well, for the moment. So we have created this website called The Quest for Sourdough, where we ask actually every person in the world who has a sourdough 
at home, in a school, in a bakery, God knows where they can have sourdough, to register it. And as such, we have a, a better view on where the sourdoughs are located. And then, of course, uh, we have some criteria that, that we use, like how old is the sourdough? It's, it's clear that a sourdough that is made like last month or last year, uh, the chances are for the moment low that this sourdough will enter in the library. But if a sourdough is like five years old, 10 years old, 30 or 100 years old, then it becomes already interesting. And then we look at what kind of flour is used, what kind of um, of starter culture is used. Was it made from grapes? Was it made from, I know that we have one made with Jamaican hibiscus or with green coffee berries. And, and as such, sourdoughs have different criteria. What is their story? What is their age? What kind of flour? Uh, where do they come from? These are all things that we take into account, but that's why it's important to have people participating on the website. For the moment, we have a, a budget that we dedicate to it, and with that budget, we can enter like 20, 20 to 25 samples every year in the library because a starter is analyzed in a lab in a university, and it takes three months. So it's not a cheap thing to do, and it takes time. But techniques to, to, to get into the DNA of a starter are getting better and better. And I think that within five or maybe 10 years, the technique will be so easy to identify what is going on in a sourdough that we could just do a shout out to everybody who has registered his or her sourdough to say, please send us a sample and, and we'll analyze them. And, and that will give us a lot of information and out of those we could then say oh these ones and these ones and these ones are interesting because of their biodiversity and as such enter them in the library so with with the library for the moment to my opinion we are really doing the, the creating a foundation for something bigger that is coming in the future Carl DeSmet, it sounds to me like you are more than the librarian. You're the one gathering up the histories. You're, you're documenting it. You're, you're going out and interviewing yes, yes, people. I, I do make some movies about the nice story. If, if a sourdough has a nice story, then I, I go to the owner of that sourdough and then we make a movie about it. And as such, I've been in Japan, China, Mexico, uh, Greece, Italy, San Francisco. I followed the Klondike Gold Rush Trail. I started in Seattle and went all the way up or down to Dawson in Alaska or in, in, in uh, Canada. Carl DeSmet, he's the sourdough librarian at the Purato Sourdough Library in Belgium. Remember that you can enjoy our Constant Wonder Conversations quite conveniently on demand or as a podcast. The place to learn more about us is byuradio.org. I'm Marcus Smith. Constant Wonder is a production of BYU Radio.